Welcome back. I'm the IntensiveMD, a double board certified intensivist, here to give you an inside look into the intensive care unit. If you want to learn more about critical care, you're in the right place. If you want to learn even more about critical care and me, you can head over to Instagram at the IntensiveMD to follow me there. Today's video is about the critical care team and who's on it. Today we'll discuss who the members of the critical care team are and what their role is. So first we're going to talk about the intensivist, that's me, and I've already made some videos about what an intensivist is and how you become an intensivist, the training involved, but in short, the intensivist is the ICU doctor. This is a doctor who has specifically trained in critical care medicine. In the United States, the training looks like four years of college, four years of medical school, some type of residency. It's usually internal medicine, surgery, emergency medicine, or anesthesia, followed by a critical care fellowship program. Of course, there are also pediatric and neonatal intensivists, and they go into a pediatric residency first prior to coming to critical care fellowship but I'm gonna speak as somebody who only takes care of adults since that is what I do. So what is the intensivist role in the intensive care unit? Our main role is to lead the critical care team. We will round on all of the patients, make the care plan for the day. We will discuss this plan with the nurse and other members of the team. We'll run multidisciplinary rounds. We'll do any procedures at bedside that the patient may need. We also speak to patients' families and discuss the diagnosis and prognosis of their illness. So as you can see, the intensivist has many tasks. We also respond to emergencies within the hospital. So whether it's in the cardiac cath lab, on the medical floor, in the dialysis unit, we may be called to a code blue or a rapid response to emergently take care of a patient in crisis. The next members of the team are the mid-level providers. So in the United States, we have mid-level providers on some of our teams, not all, but many hospitals have nurse practitioners or physician assistants who help the physician with their workload. They will also see their patients, discuss with the physician, and they may do more simple procedures in the unit. The critical care nurse or ICU nurse is a valuable member of our team. They must be a registered nurse, an RN. Many times they have to demonstrate that they've had at least two years of experience elsewhere before being hired in the intensive care unit, but there are some facilities that hire nurses fresh out of nursing school. There is a particular criteria and number of patient hours they need to meet to become critical care RN, CCRN, and another part of their certification, of course, is BLS, ACLS training. So that is emergency response and life support. So knowing CPR, knowing what medications to give during a code blue, knowing what rhythm a patient is in if they're in an abnormal rhythm so they know if the doctor needs to come and shock the patient or not. They directly take care of critically ill, acutely ill patients, and they need to closely monitor these patients. They need to titrate their medications if they're on medications that take care of their blood pressure. They need to be closely watching to know if they need more or less of this medication. Same with sedation. They need to watch closely if the patient needs more or less sedation. So they're kind of the first line of knowing what is going on with the patient minute by minute so they can alert the rest of the team if there is an issue. They also take part in speaking to the patients and their families a lot since they are very present at the bedside many times. That is the person the family sees the most as the critical care nurse. So their role in speaking with the families and addressing any concerns and bringing them up to the physician other members of the critical care team is very important. Of course, they'll alert the doctor if there's any new problems, worsening problems, new concerns, so we can come to the bedside and manage that patient emergently. Respiratory therapists play a major role in the ICU. Many patients in the intensive care unit are on mechanical ventilation, this is the device that supports breathing. So the respiratory therapist will assist with management of that. They will perform a spontaneous breathing trial if the 
physician and team feel that a patient is ready to possibly come off the ventilator, they will run some tests and come back to the physician and say, these are the numbers I got. Do you think the patient is ready for extubation? They're at bedside when we perform procedures such as bronchoscopy and intubation. They also assist with patients who are on oxygen devices or BiPAP or CPAP. And they also deliver respiratory treatments such as inhalers, nebulizers, and percussive therapy. The ICU also has a critical care pharmacist who is specifically assigned to their team. This is a pharmacist who did additional training after pharmacy school, a pharmacy residency. The critical care pharmacist works closely with the critical care team. They'll attend rounds and alert us to any concerns they have about medications. They might help us confirm a patient's home medication list. They might help us dose medications such as antibiotics or anticoagulation that's a blood thinner and they'll use lab results to help dose these medications. So it's very specific per patient, and the patient's kidney or liver function may affect these drug levels, so the pharmacist closely monitors that. They also might assist in antibiotic stewardship. This means that they make sure we're giving the patient the most appropriate narrow-spectrum antibiotic for what infection they have, or suggest us discontinuing antibiotic if it does not look like a patient has an infection. This is important because if we leave somebody on what is called broad spectrum antibiotics, either if they do not have an infection or if we found a more specific narrow range of antibiotic for this patient, that can breed resistance. We do not want antibiotic resistance so antibiotic stewardship is very important to the critical care team. They may also help with quality metrics such as DVT prophylaxis and GI prophylaxis. And I mentioned what these medications are and what they do for us in the part two of my ICU medications video released a couple weeks ago. Physical therapy and occupational therapy usually work hand in hand with our patients. Our patients may become severely debilitated or weak with a condition known as critical illness myopathy. If somebody is just laying in bed on sedation for a prolonged period of time, they lose a lot of their muscle mass. Once they are off the ventilator, physical therapy and occupational therapy start working with them so they can help them start gaining their strength back. I've discussed how many times patients do need to go to an acute care rehab setting to get even stronger, but this process starts in the hospital. They may also work with patients who are on ECMO or on the vent with the trach who are pre-transplant to keep their strength up because that is a very important thing when somebody's on the transplant list. They need to keep their strength up because that is important for the perioperative period in organ transplant. They also work with special surgical patients such as the cardiovascular patient population or the neurosurgical patient population. Obviously, early mobility in these patient populations is very, very important. So these units will have a dedicated physical therapy, occupational therapy team to get these patients moving as soon as they possibly can post-operatively. Speech-language pathology also assists us in the intensive care unit. Many times people who have been on the ventilator for a prolonged period of time, and honestly, they might not even have to be on that long for their swallow mechanism to be affected. The speech-language therapists will test a patient's swallow and they will let us know which type of diet is most appropriate for this patient. Sometimes patients are not able to eat solid food right from the get-go. Sometimes they need to have their liquids thickened so they don't aspirate, and this is when somebody is not able to swallow properly, so some of the liquid gets into their lungs. These are things that we want to prevent, so we have a speech-language pathologist come see these patients after they're extubated if there's any concern and they give us their expertise and recommendations. We also have a nutritionist who works with us very closely. Malnutrition is a major issue in the United States and a major issue in the hospital. And it's very important for these patients to stay nourished while they are trying to heal their bodies. The nutritionist will assist us with telling us what the recommended diet or feeding is for that patient. Patients who are on the ventilator will have tube feeds as their nutritional source and 
what type of tube feeds the patient should get is usually dictated by the nutritionist that will give us the recommendation, look at all the patient's labs, look at their weight, look at what their target weight is, and let us know how much and, and what type of tube feeding we should give this patient. There is also something called TPN. This is total parental nutrition, and this means that the patient gets all of their nutrition through an IV. Many times this is when somebody has had a very complex abdominal surgery and they cannot use their gut at that time, they still need to get nutrition. And the nutritionist works closely with the critical care pharmacist to determine exactly what formulation this patient needs because it is very specific patient to patient. So again, they look at all of their labs, they look at their weight, they look at what their needs are for that day, and they calculate what their TPN formulation is. Another group that works hand in hand is social work and case management. Many times the social worker might help us find the patient's family or next of kin. A lot of times they'll help the patient's family work with insurance, let them know what kind of benefits are avail available to the patient. If the patient does not have insurance, they know of programs where the patient's costs will be covered. So they're a good resource for that. They also will help with post-discharge planning. They'll work typically with case management. So after the patient leaves the ICU, I've discussed in a prior video, most of the time they do not go home. So the social worker and the case manager will help look at what facilities are available to that patient, what their insurance covers, and which facilities the family is interested in so they can help progress the patient to the next phase of care. They may also help with hospice referrals if a family is opting for hospice measures. They'll work with the family and let them know which hospice resources they qualify for. They may also provide resources in terms of addiction counseling, substance abuse, if there's any concerns for safety at home, they're also a good resource for this. And finally, there are a couple members of the team that may or may not be on every critical care team, but they are on my critical care team. The palliative care team is a team that focuses on patient comfort. They might help with somebody who has a lot of pain, especially if they take a lot of pain medications at home, they're experts in pain management. They also help with emotional support with the patient and their family. They are an additional person who will discuss code status and goals of care with the patient and their family. So we make sure that we are honoring each patient's wishes. Many faith-based hospitals will have clergy or a chaplain available for support, emotional support, if the patient and family would like it. We offer it to all of our patients, some will decline, and that's fine. If somebody feels that they need extra spiritual support, there's typically a chaplain or somebody from the clergy who is available and on call within the hospital 24 seven. Many times my Catholic patients ask me if there is a priest available for last rites, and we do have a priest on call, or many times people want their own priest, their own chaplain, their own pastor come to the hospital at the end of life, and that's fine too. They don't have to use our staff. And finally, the medical ethics team might round with us at times. They're not utilized for every patient. Sometimes if there is an ethical dilemma, we will call upon them to be a third party to look at the situation and let us know what the most ethical thing for the patient is at that time. So I hope you enjoyed the introduction to all of the members of the critical care team. If you're a member of the critical care team, let me know below and let me know what your role is. If I missed anything with your specific role, I apologize. I wanted this to be a quick overview. Of course, all of these people do much more than what I have mentioned in this video. If you're interested in hearing more about the critical care unit, don't forget to subscribe to my channel or follow me over on Instagram at the intense MD. I will see you next week in the next video.